Our center, along with IBC Bank and Commerce Bank, brings speakers to talk about topics in the areas of international trade, economics, finance, demography, immigration, and governance. Before introducing today's speaker, I'd like to thank our sponsors for supporting the event, IBC Bank and Commerce Bank. With their support, we've been able to bring many thought-provoking speakers over the years to Tammy Yu and to Laredo. So let's give them a, a hand. Thank you. Also, before we start, I'd like to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, at the end of Dr. Neil's pre um, presentation, there's going to be a question and answer session. We'll take questions from the audience in attendance here today, um, as well as from those joining us virtually. For those in attendance, um, please raise your hand and one of our student um, assistants will bring you a microphone. It's important that you use the microphone so everybody can hear you, including the online participants. Um, for those attending virtually, you can submit your question using the Q&A feature in WebEx, and we will try to get to as many questions as our allotted time allows. Um, for students attending in person, on behalf of one of your classes, you should have had your student ID scanned at the door. In addition, you were provided with a QR code that will take you to an online form where you will submit your class information. Finally, you'll scan your ID when departing once the lecture's ended. For students attending online, your class information should have been submitted during the registration process. So today's speaker is Dr. Shannon O'Neill. She's the Vice President, Deputy Director of Studies, and Nelson and David Rockefeller Senior Fellow for the Latin American Studies um, at the Council of Foreign Relations in New York City. She's an expert on Latin America, global trade, US-Mexico relations, corruption, democracy, and immigration. She's also the author of several books, including the recent book, The Globalization Myth, Why Regions Matter, which was published by Yale University Press in October 2022. She's a columnist for Bloomberg Opinion and is a frequent guest on national broadcast news and radio programs. She's testified before Congress and regularly speaks to global academic, business, and policy conferences. She's lived and worked in both Mexico and, the, and Argentina and was a Fulbright scholar. She holds a PhD in government from Harvard University. We're very pleased to have her here for our 2022-2023 IBC Commerce Bank keynote speaker series. And she will be presenting the globalization myth, why regions matter. So let's welcome Dr. O'Neill to Tamayu and to Laredo. Well, good evening, all. Thank you for having me. And actually, thanks for having me back, because I was here maybe seven or eight years ago to talk about a previous book I wrote about Mexico and the United States. And so today, um, thank you for hosting me to talk about the globalization myth. Um, so I am uh, just a headline. I'm going to talk about globalization, and I'm going to talk about what I really think has happened over the last 40 years, which is regionalization uh, and why that matters to the United States, why that matters for Mexico, and why that matters for many countries around the world. But let me start off this talk talking a little bit uh, about setting the stage with a tale of two U.S. cities. So one of these cities is Akron, Ohio, and that is the town that I am originally from. So Akron, Ohio made its name in the post-World War II period, the 1950s and 1960s, uh, when it was called the rubber capital of the world. Um, at the time, it was producing one out of um, almost one out of two tires that were made uh, globally, uh, and it brought great prosperity to this town. It grew in terms of people. It grew in terms of stature. There was in-migration as people came to work in the factories and all the kinds of services that arose around them. It became a very prosperous place for a number of decades. This all started to change in the 1970s and the early 1980s. The tire companies started facing incredibly stiff competition from Japanese tire makers and the car companies they were associated with, uh, from French and German tire makers. And it became so difficult, so competitive, um, that by 1982, the last tire came off of an assembly line in Akron, Ohio, and there have been none made since. The town in the following decade lost other economic jobs, it lost other industries, it lost people. Uh, and Akron, I would argue, became one of the towns that's really associated with the Rust Belt, uh, with um, what many would say a victim of 
globalization of the time. Now let me contrast that with the town of Columbus, Indiana. Columbus, Indiana is about a four hour drive from Akron. It's about the same size in terms of, of people, or at least at the time. It was also a town that saw a real post-World War II boom um, because it is the home of Cummins engines. Um, so Cummins engines in that period, as the Marshall Plan rolled across Europe and we turned to Asia and Japan and rebuilding there, Cummins engines were the engines for lots of the heavy machinery, for the trucks, for the cars, and the others that drove that uh, time in the global economy. But Cummins engines also hit hard times in the late 70s and in the, in the 1980s. They started seeing competition from Japanese engine makers who started getting the contracts with Ford, with Caterpillar, with others because they were more efficient and they were more affordable. They also faced competition from Europeans, from BMW, from Mercedes and others. Uh, and they too hit the ropes and, and they looked at a point where they might not survive either. But they were able to eke it out through the 1980s. And in the 1990s, Cummins found a new path. And they found that path, I would argue, because of NAFTA. They were, with the signing of NAFTA and the implementation of NAFTA, they were able then to change their business model. They could move some of the labor costs down to Mexico and do more intensive labor in Mexico. Um, they were able to expand their markets and in fact gain access to the Mexican market as tariffs fell. And today they're the number one truck engine sold in Mexico. Most of those engines build in a plant in upstate New York. Um, they were able to finally compete with the Japanese on quality and on price, and they were able to get back some of those contracts from Ford, from others that they had lost in the 1980s. And Cummins today is a tens of billions of dollars company in terms of market cap, but it is a global company again, and it has been able to thrive and has Columbus, Indiana. Now these two Midwestern cities and industrial cities have really different paths. Um, and what I will argue, and, and we'll talk about here and, and through the question and answer, is that Akron's challenge was not necessarily globalization, but it was limited regionalization. When it started hitting its tough times, when it started competing against others, the other companies they were competing against had already regionalized. The Japanese tire makers and tar companies had spread their production across parts of Asia. And so they had economies of scale, they had specialization, they had different access to labor and markets. So they were able to make more affordable and higher quality products. The French Michelin and the German Continental, also tire companies, they were part of the European community, which was the predecessor to the European Union today. So they too had access to six different markets. They had access to a whole depth there without paying tariffs. They could also have economies of scale. They also were able to lower their costs, but keep their quality high. And Akron, Ohio, in making tires was alone in this process. They didn't have access to um, those broader markets, those deeper labor forces, those different kinds of innovation. And that was part of why they suffered. Uh, and Cummins engines, um, while they were almost on the brink, they were able to find regionalization as a way out of it and not suffer from the challenges um, that globalization provided. So let me talk a little bit. These two stories and these two very different trajectories of U.S. towns, I think, have played out in many places around the United States, as well as other parts of the world, where we talk a lot about globalization. But some of what really we should be thinking about is whether places have tied into regional economic networks or not. So I titled this book The Globalization Myth. Um, and I would argue that there are two main myths about the way we think about globalization today. You know, we all hear about globalization. If you pick up the newspaper or you watch the news, people talk about globalization today and you, you know, you like it or you, you hate it. You have very strong feelings about it. But as we look back at these last 40 years, these years of hyper globalization that some might call it or where we see this opening up, it has not been as widespread or all encompassing as we're often told. And in fact, when you start looking at the economic data, there are only 25 countries that have truly transformed their economies over the last 40 years with quote unquote globalization. So there's only two dozen economies that have seen trade double or more as part of their economy, where they've really seen a transformation. And in contrast, there are dozens more, there are 89 to be precise countries that since 1980 to today, they either saw trade as part of their economy stay the same, or they saw trade as part of their economy decrease. So we have seen a number of countries that have deglobalized over these last 40 years. 
So that's one myth, is that it just hasn't been as widespread or all penetrating as it is often portrayed. The second myth about the way we often think about globalization is that when companies went abroad, when money went abroad, when people went abroad to look for clients or to look for suppliers, and they did, we've seen trade jump from $2 trillion in 1980 to $22 trillion today. But when they went, they usually didn't go to the other side of the world. They didn't really globalize. Sure, we can point to you know, particular companies that did globalize, Boeing sources from 58 different countries, and we have other big brand names that you all know supply and, and have supply and demand throughout the world. But alongside the very high profile companies, we see thousands, tens of thousands of companies that yes, they did internationalize, but when they did, they went much closer by. They went to countries in their regions. And one telling statistic that brings this home is that the average good that is traded travels 3,000 miles. And that is about the distance from New York to Los Angeles. That doesn't get you to Shanghai. It doesn't get you to Berlin. It is much more regional than we often think. So when you combine these two, that not that many countries actually participated in this globalization of the last 40 years. And when they did, they stayed closer to home than we often think. And what you've gotten over these last 40 years is the rise of three big manufacturing and commercial regions, a European one, an Asian one, and a North American one. And between those three regions, 90% of all global trade occurs. So the rest of those world, the dozens of countries in Latin America and Africa and the Middle East and South Asia, they only produce 10% of global trade. They're on the margins of what has happened in this time of quote unquote globalization. But what we've also seen of these three big regions that really dominate all of this trade is that they're not created equally. They're not regionalized equally. So as we look at this, as we look at Europe, about 66, 67% of trade and money and movement happens within Europe. Europe makes things together and they sell things together. We look at Asia. Asia in 1980, only 30% of trade was within Asia. That's risen today to 60%. So Asians too tend to make things together and increasingly sell and buy things from each other. In North America, where we are here, Mexico, the United States, and Canada, in the days right before NAFTA, about 40% of the trade went between the three countries. In the decade after NAFTA, those numbers rose to 47, 48%. So almost you know, one out of every $2 or one out of every two pesos was within the three countries. But then in the 2000s, that fell back down to 40%. So yes, North America is very integrated. Uh, it's much more integrated than the rest of the world. If you look at Latin America or Africa, the trade between countries is only 10, maybe 15%. So when they trade, they trade with nations far, far away. Though Their trade is not that big, as I mentioned. It's only 10% of global trade. But North America is not as integrated as Europe is. It's not as integrated as Asia is. And I would argue that some of the challenges that we've seen here in the United States, we've seen in Mexico, we've seen in Canada in terms of losing jobs, of eroding of communities and the like, in part it is that the commercial advantage that has come from deeper regionalization that we haven't benefited from it because we're not as regional as those other big hubs in our competitors. Now, why this matters? Um, it matters because I think we often misunderstand why we have these challenges in the United States. Um, it's because, to me, this lack of, of regionalization or the limits on regionalization rather than globalization writ large. That's one of the reasons. I think it's we also misunderstand a bit of who the winners and losers from globalization are. Um, many people, quote unquote, were losers from globalization because they didn't participate. Um, many of these countries that didn't participate are those that have remained on the margins that have grown much more slowly in Latin America or in Africa and the like. But it's also important because I think it, we misunderstand what trade is and what kinds of trade benefits people. Um, and I would argue that certain kinds of trade is better uh, for the United States or any country. Um, than others. And I would argue that regional trade is often better for communities, for companies, U.S.-based companies, and U.S.-based workers. And the reason is because if a factory opens up in Mexico, and they're going to look for international suppliers, because that's how they're going to be competitive in terms of price and quality, they're far more likely 
to buy from US-based companies and US-based workers than anywhere else in the world. Um, and we have lots of statistics out there, but one is that you know when things come in from Mexico, some 40% of those products on average was actually made in the United States, those inputs into those products that are quote unquote made in Mexico. The alternative is if you have something coming in from China, less than 5% of that product was actually made in the United States. So China, they have regional supply chains, they're hooked into regional supply chains, um, but they don't use the US as a supplier. They use Asia as a supplier. They use Japan, they use South Korea, they use Thailand, they use Vietnam and others. So part of trade and part of this regionalization is that regional trade is just better for US workers and US companies because it allows you on the one side to have economies of scale, to have specialization, to have different access to markets and to have bigger consumer bases so you can actually be more competitive. But it also allows you to keep more jobs here because the suppliers are much more likely to buy from suppliers or to have customers that are in the place. So regional trade um, provides different benefits than global trade provides to companies and to communities. That's why it matters for the United States. Um, since we're here on the border, why does it matter for Mexico? Let me talk a bit about why I think it's also very important for Mexico. And regionalization is one of the important factors that has really transformed Mexico, or at least transformed its economy over the last 40 plus years. You know, Mexico went from being primarily a commodity driven economy in the 1970s and, and early 80s that exported oil and, and other commodities to today being one of the most open economies in the world. So trade as part of their GDP as their economy grew substantially, doubled and more over these last 40 years. But it also tra changed in what actually is being traded. And so today, Mexico, rather than being a commodity producer, is an advanced manufacturer, whether it's auto parts or aerospace or all sorts of other machinery and electronics. This is a place that has transformed its economic base um, and largely because of regionalization, because of the ties to the United States. This also explains in some ways the challenges that Mexico has and particularly the north-south divide. When you look at the differences in terms of the growth of states and sort of the performance of states, the northern states over these last couple of decades have grown sometimes five, six, seven, eight, ten percent a year. You see productivity rates rise, you see education rates grow, you see health and human indicators, lifespans, all of that much higher in the north and the south. And that's in large part because it's tied to the region. This is the region that's tied to the United States and somewhat to Canada, not the south of the country. So it's explained some of these north-south divides, the winners and losers, one could say, in Mexico of globalization. But Mexico, too, has lost out because of the limited regionalization of North America. And in many ways, I would say many Mexican communities have lost out even more um, because they were direct competitors with Asian supply chains, with European supply chains, and particularly with China at the end of those supply chains. So we have seen the apparel industry leave, we've seen the shoe industry leave, we've seen lots of electronics industries leave and go to Asia. Um, and in large part because the limited regionalization made it much harder for any of the three economies in North America to compete with the strength and robustness of the supply chains that were forming in Asia. So here, Mexico, along with the United States, but Mexico to me really shows the promise of regionalization, but also the losses that happen when you have limited regionalization. So this is the last 30, 40 years. We've seen an expansion in internationalization, um, but only a certain number of countries and those that did participate and benefit regionalizing. But the world is changing again. The globalization that we often are debating and that we're worried about, it's changing again. It started changing before COVID, started changing in the 2010s, and COVID has accelerated many of these changes. So let me talk a bit about what's coming down the pike and what it's gonna mean for globalization, but what it's also gonna mean for the United States and for the US-Mexico border. So there are a lot of things that are transforming the way we make things, buy things, sell things, um, and use things. One of the biggest changes that's underway is automation. We are seeing a total transformation in the way that we make things. And because of the rise of automation, of robots, of algorithms, of software, of all kinds of, of AI and the like, labor costs in many industries are less of a part of total operating costs than before. Other kinds of things matter more. So that's one big change. And so producing things in low cost countries is not, for at least for some industries, no longer quite as important as it was back 20, 30 years ago. Another big change is demographics. In some places that were young, that had big labor forces, are no longer so young, are no longer so cheap. Uh, and one of the biggest changes here is China. China already 
is seeing its demographics decline, its population decline. It's going to see, in the next 15 years, 100 million people leave its labor force. That's bigger than the whole labor force of Mexico. <laughs> it's a big chunk of the US labor force, and they are going to leave because of demographics, because the number of workers is in decline. So China is not going to get any cheaper as we go forward. Another big thing that's changing supply chains and, and, and the movement of goods and the making and manufacturing of goods is climate change. And it's changing it in two ways. It's changing it in the effects of climate change. So you have natural disasters, you have rising sea levels that make logistics in and out of ports more expensive. You need to rebuild them and, and lift them up. But it's also changing the nature of supply chains and international trade because of the policies that countries are introducing um, that put tariffs on that extra mile. So Europe is putting a carbon border adjustment mechanism, which is basically a tariff on goods that come from places that don't have as clean an energy matrix as European countries do. Um, or on each extra mile, they're putting a tariff because it's producing carbon into the atmosphere. So you're seeing a change in supply chains and in the cost for producing in various places because of policies as well as the actual outcomes of climate change. And finally, the other thing um, in terms of market-based effects and changes is what customers want and how fast they want it. I think all of us in the pandemic got very used to clicking on you know, a button and whether it's Amazon or any other website, and we wanted it the next day. We expected things faster. And so when that happens, you know, something that takes, you know, comes across the ocean in a container, even if you leave aside the you know, COVID logistics and the challenges that happen in delays, 45 days across the ocean means you lose orders. People don't want that shirt anymore. They want something different that comes across. So the cost of time and money, um, time is costing more for many companies. And so that distance that you see across Pacific, the Pacific or the Atlantic is, is incredibly important and changing the nature of demand. And the final thing I want to put on the table is geopolitics. Um, and if you follow the news, you know that geopolitics are changing. They've been changing for a while, but in particular, the challenges between the United States and China in terms of the production, in terms of the sales between the two um, in many sectors um, are rising. And this is going to become more and more costly and more uncertain for companies that are producing. And it matters for industries that the US government or the Chinese government or Europeans for that matter see as part of their national security. So this is semiconductors. This is pharmaceuticals. You want to make sure you have access to medicines. This is a whole host of critical minerals that go into all kinds of products. This is green energy or green uh, transition types of equipment and the like. But we're seeing many policies put in place that hamper the movement of all kinds of things, all kinds of basic electronics because of tariffs or all kinds of other equipment and the things that come in and out. So this too is changing the calculations of companies and where it makes sense to produce. Now, all of this is producing a once in a generation fluidity to global supply chains. Things are beginning to move around the world. Um, and with people, as companies begin to invest in creating new capacity or, or new plants and the like, they're rethinking where they normally put things. So they're looking at demographics. They're looking at automation. They're looking at geopolitics and the kinds of policies that are put in place. They're looking at logistics costs and the like. And many of these look different than they did 10, 20, and especially 30 years ago. Um, so it is a moment for the United States um, and for any country, frankly, who was left out or had challenges in the last round of globalization um, to re-enter. It's a new opportunity um, for any country to take. Now, as I look at it for the United States, there's many benefits we have. Um, you know, we are not a low cost country, but we don't need to be a low cost country in a world of automation. Um, we are a country that actually has decent demographics, particularly compared to many Asian countries and compared to many European countries. We're the world's largest market, so being close to the market, we're right here. So you don't have to worry about the transportation time and logistics costs. But as we go forward, except for a few crucial industries that the US government will subsidize indefinitely, things like semiconductors or the Defense Department and many things that they need, companies are still going to have to make money. You're still going to have to be profitable and have high quality at affordable prices if you're going to beat out the competition and succeed in selling to consumers. And so in this, regionalization will still matter because the benefits that you get from international supply chains, from 
having specialization, from having this larger access to markets and the like that you get from producing across countries, that will still be there. And that is something that any country around the world, if you want to succeed as these supply chains move around, you need, you need to find your friends, right? Manufacturing has become a team sport, and so you need to find your partners in that. So what should the United States do? What should we do about this, given we have a once in a generation opportunity as supply chains move around and become much more fluid, where things are up for grabs? So let me put a few things out on the table. One is we need to think about infrastructure. Um, we have a government, the US, the federal government, that just approved you know, a trillion plus dollars worth of money for infrastructure. And so as we think about that infrastructure, we need to think about making it logistics cheaper in the United States, but also making sure that infrastructure connects us to our manufacturing partners, whether that's Mexico, Canada, or others around the world. That's one part. We need to think about education. The factories of the present and particularly of the future um, they're not going to be the factories of the 20th century. They're not going to be the tire companies um, that left Akron, Ohio, or the old engine companies um, of Cummins. They are going to be automated. Um, they are going to be much more specialized. Um, and they're going to need a different kind of training um, than we have in the past. So changing educational systems and, and training programs, that is key to the future and key to retraining those who are already in the job market, um, but will be working in other places in the future. But I would argue that more than almost anything else, we need to change the mindset. We need to think not just about buy American, um, but buy more regional, and that means buy North American. So we need to start thinking as we put together economic plans and commercial plans and like, we need to start thinking about how we tie ourselves to others to get a bigger, perhaps a smaller piece, but of a much bigger pie um, than just a domestic market. Uh, so what does this mean? So this means as we spend hundreds of billions of dollars on the Inflation Reduction Act, which is this idea of transforming the US uh, energy matrix and, and building electric vehicles and transforming the way we think about our transportation industry and the like, is that we build in a place for our neighbors um, and our other allies. Some of that's in that, in that legislation, some of that is not. It means as we build our infrastructure that we use that infrastructure to tie to our neighbors and not just to ourselves. It means as we think about education, that we think about education and training all along the supply chain, which is going to cross borders. So whether it's the movement of professional people back and forth so they can share knowledge and, and expertise, or whether it's training of workforces that are gonna, the parts that they make are gonna depend on the parts on the other side of the border. You need to make sure it's high quality. And so thinking about those things much more broadly, that is a way for a more prosperous US future. Um, and I will say that there's an opportunity now, and right now in this next five to 10 years is a huge moment and opportunity, but the United States is not the only country that's thinking about that opportunity. And so today, the single biggest investor in automation in robots today is China. They are making this transition because they see their demographic cliff coming and, and they see what the future looks like. The, other countries around the world are going around and signing free trade agreements to try to bring this regionalization. China, again, is one of the leaders here. They have brought together a dozen plus Asian nations in a free trade agreement that will make it easier to make things across those nations. Europe has gone out and is signing free trade agreements with Canada, with, the, with South America, with other countries around the world too, trying to build, these co build places where they can produce more cheaply and bring in through you know, lower tariffs and regulations and rules of origin and all the kinds of stuff that go into free trade agreements. Africa too has signed a continental free trade agreement with the hopes that they too can regionalize and gain some of these benefits. So lots of parts of the world are moving forward. They see this benefit and are moving forward in the United States at least so far, is not as interested in gaining access to these markets and is not pushing forward on all of this. One of the other things I want to put on the table uh, about regionalization that I think is important is this doesn't necessarily have to go to the lowest common denominator. We often think about in the past, well, everybody went to China because it was low labor costs and, and that's why, you know, there's no way you can bring that back. Um, and there's no way that you can really thrive in that sense in terms of good paying jobs and the like. And what I do want to put on the table is the United States thinks more about regionalization. They think more about how do we bring back 
jobs to our communities is that it doesn't have to be that low cost equilibrium. It can actually end up being in a high cost one. And one of my favorite examples from the book and the research that I did in writing the book is uh, the case of Zara. So I don't know how many of you have shopped at Zara, but Zara is a fast fashion uh, uh, clothing brand. It is actually the biggest fast fashion brand in the world. They sell half a trillion dollars worth of goods every year. Uh, and they are the highest, most profitable fast fashion brand in the world. And the way they do this is that by and large, they make very little in Asia. They make almost all of their products in Europe or the countries right around Europe that have free trade agreements with Europe. So they use a mix of automation. They use a lot of automation. They do a lot of small batches and the like. They tinker with design, unlike, and they get things to the shelves very, very quickly through all these systems. And as a result, they don't often mark down their products. So they're very profitable. And what the story of Zara tells me as I think about the United States is that even in the most cutthroat of industries, fast fashion, even in a place where the margins are so small, you can have an industry that thrives and in fact beats out its competitors uh, working in places that have high wages, um, high labor protections, and high environmental standards. Um, so the path for the United States for North America more generally doesn't have to be this race to the bottom. It can be a race to the top or at least a place at the top um, because others have done it in many industries. So to close, I just want to come back to there's so much talk about there about globalization and then increasingly in the last couple of years, particularly with COVID, in talks about deglobalization, about slowbalization, about are we ending these ties um, that we see with the rest of the world? And I would say, I don't buy that. But I do think it is changing and adapting. But what's most important to recognize is where we have been is not necessarily globalization. It is more often than not regionalization. And so as we see the world economy change, as we see the movement of manufacturing and goods and services and people and the whole network of international supply chains that we've built over this last 40, 50 years, it is going to be regionalization that is adapting more than globalization. And finally, I would argue for the United States to win in this economic competition, to do better in this economic competition, it is going to be, it is going to require that they double down again and more on regionalization. So thank you all, and I look forward to your questions. So we're going to now have our question and answer session. Um, so if you're in the audience, um, please stick up your hand and one of our students will bring um, you a, a microphone. Um, if, you're, if you're online, and we have uh, nearly 200 people online um, listening in, um, please type your questions into the, into the chat box and we will try to get to those as, as, as well. But um, we, we've already got a couple of questions from the audience here, so let's start with the audience here. Yeah, I have two questions. Um, one, um, with the current trend towards the fragmentation of the world in two, three blocks, uh, that entails uh, more difficulties in reaching agreements at the global level that we need to reach for climate change and sustainability. I would like you to comment on that. And two, um, this uh, call for regionalization um, is uh, by and large uh, focus on the economic dimension. I think um, we need to emphasize more and more uh, also the social that has been sidelined in the past and we know the consequences of uneven development and the difficulties of uneven development and also on the environmental dimension. Okay. Uh, it's the three big legs of sustainability that need to reach a balance. Uh, I would like you to comment on that regard, please. Sure. So on the first, you know, this sort of fragmentation um, that is happening along geopolitical lines, I do think that really, as I look at this next decade, it is geopolitics 
and industrial policy, frankly, that is going to be guiding sort of international commerce going forward much more than it has over the last 40 years. You know, see every country or many countries are returning and, and you see a rise of industrial policy. Ours you know, included and, and perhaps more earnestly than we've seen in, in many decades. So I do think this is really important. What I also see in the geopolitics is there's a fragmentation, um, but there is also a regionalization in that part, right? So you see that in uh, first many of the policies being put uh, in place in the European Union, whether that is, you know, many of their um, you know, ESG focus or they're environmentally focused, whether it is their plan for a green transition, you know, the Fit for 55 program, whether there's a whole host of programs that they're putting in place that's really tying together the countries of Europe in a much tighter regional space than, than you have seen in, in a while, I would say. Um, when I look here at the United States and I look at a lot of the industrial policies or the geopolitics there, right, the sort of push to decouple from China in a whole host of industries, um, that is one of the main factors leading to this fluidity of supply chains um, that people are feeling if we're going to supply the U.S. market, we can't be touching China, depending on what industry you're in. But there's a number of them. It's not just a couple. Um, and so they're looking where to go. And so there, I think that has a regional bent to it is, you know, we're seeing already um, in Mexico the movement of much, you know, capacity and others opening up plants in Mexico as a way to provide to the United States market without touching China. So I think there's a regional element there. And then frankly, as I was saying, you know, I think China is pushing for a regional approach itself, right? It is going through, you know, regional free trade agreements like the RCEP, the Regional uh, Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which is sort of a dozen plus countries in Asia, what, through their Belt and Road Initiative, which is investment. They're really focused. They, I mean, they spend globally, but the a majority is in Asia and focused on tying those countries together so that they really have uh, a market strength in, in a lot of those places. So I think there is an element of the geopolitics and the fragmentation and the divides we're seeing um, tends to break some of the globalization. I'm, I, there is globalization, right? There are companies that are global, but some of these geopolitics are breaking or making it more difficult for those companies that aspire to be truly global. And so I think you will see sort of a fall back in, in some of the regional aspects. Now, what does it mean for the environment? What does it mean for sort of social and, and, and governance issues? You know, I think it kind of cuts both ways. If you, you know, if you want to lower carbon overall, then producing things closer to home is at least one way to, to do so, right? It, it helps with, with that aspect. Um, part of the reason that we see so much money that was um, you know, put into the Inflation Reduction Act, into the US green transition, is partly an anti-China aspect, right? We didn't want our solar panels to be made in China. We didn't want the next green technologies, the hydrogen um, and electric vehicles and the like to be made in China or to be dependent on that. We wanted to have uh, a node here. So there's there's lots of, of money being put in to kind of recreate those supply chains here. So there is also, and Europe looks like they will follow with, with some sort of similar aspect. So I think there's some aspects there where you see a push um, in terms of money um, that has a national security side as the way it's framed, as well as sort of a green transition side. Now, in terms of our ability to deal with big global challenges, whether it's you know climate change or nuclear proliferation or all kinds of things, it's more difficult if you have the world siloed off, if you have certain blocks that aren't talking to other blocks, right? if you can't work in a, in a truly multilateral setting, you don't have the WTO or you don't have other element, you know, kind of bodies that would have negotiated some of that. And you know, we're seeing that as, as you know, with all the challenges with Russia, we're seeing you know, lots of the nuclear nonproliferation agreements that were there being broken and, and ended. And so some of that I think is, is really challenging, right? How do you deal with global problems if you're not talking together as a globe? Um, at least or aspiring to work together as a globe. I think that is a, is a huge challenge. But th there are two sides to this, right? Some of the regional side will allow certain areas to move forward because you know you, you, it's very hard to get almost 200 countries together to agree on anything. So sometimes we make progress in the world on various issues because we get a group of countries, like-minded countries together who push forward and, and set standards and the like, and then others you know join or follow along. And so there are costs and benefits to this regionalization, but, I, but there's both sides to that, I would say. Uh, congratulations, very good conversation. Juan Elite from Emerson, manufacturing company. <clears throat> uh, also, I, I'm, I'm really heavily involved in uh, supply chain efforts to develop more supply chains for our manufacturing plants in Mexico. Very, very, very close to the numbers that you just mentioned. 
85% of the components that are used on the maquiladoras in Mexico is imported. And half of that is from the US and the other half is overseas and Europe and everywhere. So you're right, we, we need to get that into this region for, for the competition. However, some of the major problems we have seen is in the US, shortage of labor. Most of our suppliers has, have shortage of labor. Uh, probably new higher, higher salary uh, jobs, but definitely uh, 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 manufacturing and injection, foundries, uh, machining, etc. there is shortage of labor. In the other side, in Mexico, some of the troubles that we have infrastructure, definitely, energy in certain regions, and, and especially also the, fi the financially. So we don't have an IBC in Mexico. Talk to the guys right up here. Yeah. <laughs> no, as you know, in Mexico, the, the, the financing is very, yes. very, very expensive. So what kind of things we can work together as a region so we take the advantages and also the, 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 the weakness of the others and we can try to work together to, to, to try to get into this competition globally as a region? Yeah. Those are, those are all very valid points and, 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 a, and a real part of the challenge, right? One is what would be good and what could, ha you know, what the, what we should aspire to and, and what the possibilities are if we find this integration and the others are the real roadblocks to getting there. And so I see, you know, in the glass half full, the things that are moving forward, I do see the money that will go into infrastructure being helpful, right? And so logistics can be, can be a bit, um, you know, be, be a lesser cost. I do see, some of the efforts and the turn, at least in some parts of the US government, to think about things more regionally, whether it's the way subsidies are structured and the like that would allow Mexico to take advantage as well as the United States and, and Canada. But these are real concerns, right? You have all this money for infrastructure, but who's gonna build those roads, right? Who's gonna build the ports and who's gonna rebuild this? Because we have a real challenge in, in terms of, of labor shortages. And you know, partly it is um, sort of the long effects of of COVID, you know, people who have not come back into the labor force or, you know, the million plus migrants who just didn't come because of, of various reasons. Um, and so, you know, part is, uh, can the US government, it's, it's um, unlikely, let's say, that we will see uh, migration legislation happen. Um, but there are pockets here and there that you see the Biden administration and others trying to find, whether it's, you know, making sure you use full, full uh, access to the numbers of guest workers that can come in under certain programs and expanding them to the you know limits that that they can you know bear given the legislation, um, whether it is speeding the processing of asylum cases so that at least those are decided so people aren't waiting and unable to work until their case is decided either it's decided they can stay and and then they can work or it's decided they have to leave and they have to leave but but moving those cases along um, we have seen you know temporary protected status, sort of different, there's another kind of, you know, visa status where different people can come. And so I think, you know, one on the labor shortage is, can we bring more people here? Um, two is, can we get more people who would be in the workforce back into the workforce or, or into the workforce? And can we get them into the workforce in ways that would be um, more productive or more focused on the kinds of skills and, and labor that we really see shortages in this kind of area, right? Rather than other kinds of, say, you know, labor that they might be doing. So I think there's sort of lots of elements to this, but, you know, whether it's the United States, whether it's, it's other countries, you know, I think the labor shortage is real. And you start looking at the demographic profile of, of lots of countries and um, it's not gonna get easier. And, you know, the fact that the United States, I know we have a labor shortage, but it's not as, to say it's not as bad as other places and what they're gonna face is kind of cold comfort, right? That you're gonna see worse demographics in Europe or worse demographics in, in a particular set of Asian countries than ours is not, is not a real solution to that. So I think that's, that's one side. Um, I mean, I will say that one thing that has disheartened me, frankly, is that, you know, for, I would say for 25, 30 years of the three, you know, North American countries, Mexico was probably the most eager and, and forward leaning into North America. Um, you know, they were the ones who sort of brought NAFTA to the table at the beginning that then became, you know, all three countries. They were the ones who have sort of pushed forward. And right now with the current government, they are not the most forward leaning. They're the most reluctant uh, of all of them. And whether that is 
you know, their energy policy and, and sort of questions about whether you can get consistent, affordable, clean energy for any kind of manufacturing now or even or especially into the future, um, whether that is, you know, um, differences in the, you know, deciding about, you know, corn and, and food processing. There's all kinds of issues here that, that are on the table. And so, um, you know, for this vision to come about, you're going to need a, a Mexico is going to have to be a partner as well. And I think as I look at the Mexican government, I see much less interest at the federal level. I see a lot of interest at the state level. Um, and so, you know, you're going to have to see which which areas you can work with. Can you work with certain states and, and how far can you get with that in terms of, you know, the water and electricity and the other things in the financing. Um, but I think at least for right now, um, the federal government is not going to be the biggest ally in helping address all the issues that you rightly put on the table. So I have a few questions from online that we can take now and then we'll go back to the audience again. Um, so the first question is from Maurizio Rousselon and he asks, how can we make the US-Mexico region more productive and palatable to US um, border state politicians? <laughs> I leave it to your Texans. You guys tell me, but no. <laughs> you know, it's interesting to me that when I look at polls of U.S. citizens and and over the years, but particularly in in more recent years, and you know, trade is seen as a strong majority in some polls. A vast majority of, of Americans see trade as an opportunity, as not a threat. They see the benefits there. Um, so I think there is an opening to convince people um, and perhaps the politicians that represent them that this can be a good thing. Um, and I guess especially just let's focus on the border states and, and, and look at Texas. I mean, I think the leadership here does see the vitality of, of the ties to Mexico. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, I dare I say, I'm not a Texan politician, nor am I a Texan, but, you know, when you did see earlier um, in, in the last couple of years, the U.S.-Mexico border or the U.S. Tex uh, the Texas-Mexico border slow and the movement of goods slow or, or, or stop for, for various reasons, um, you saw a real cost to jobs here. You saw a real cost to the economy of Texas. And Texas, more than almost any state, is incredibly linked to Mexico, independent, and, and part of the you know, dynam dynamism here is that tie. And so, you know, how do you convince those politicians? I think it is, you know, those who benefit um, in the business community who need to talk to those politicians, but it's also students. It's also others that need to help provide a different point of view. And, and perhaps, you know, you all as the voters, perhaps they will listen to you. I think that is, you know, you know, if your politicians aren't listening to you, then I think voters need to speak more loudly. I think that's how, you know, you get around this issue. And the next question from online, and I want to encourage the online participants to um, submit questions. We will, we will get to your questions if you, um, if you submit them, um, is from Rodolfo. And he wants to know, how long do you think it would take um, regionalization for the North American countries. Building the Asia factory took us almost 40 years, and I think you could make a similar point that the European Union um, didn't, didn't yeah. spring up overnight either. No, this is definitely true, right? You saw this growth over time, but the, I don't think it takes 40 years. I think this is something that you could do, um, you could do significantly in a decade, and for a few reasons. One is you already have a base, right? You're not starting from zero. You already have pretty intricate supply chains between, between the various nations and a, a base of knowledge and logistics and, and the other. So that's one part. The other part is I do think right now we are in a historic moment and time of opportunity. Partly the reason why it took 40 years is you just, you, you know, there's a lot of of stasis and inertia, because once you set up a supply chain, once you actually find someone you trust, you know is gonna deliver Monday morning at 10 a.m. and it's gonna be good quality and you have the right price and you have all the system set up and the like and you've signed the contract, it's really hard to move, right? You, you know, think about if you're trying to, like think about if you're at school and all of a sudden you're not just gonna to go tomorrow and say, you know what, I'm gonna to go to school in Minnesota. I'm just gonna go up there and I'm gonna find an apartment and I'm gonna get myself in. You don't, you don't move so quickly, right? And supply chains are even stickier than that because there's a lot of you know, profits and loss and, and potential bankruptcy on the line if you make the wrong decision. So if you already have something that's working, you know, don't mess with it, it's already working. But right now, because of all the factors we were talking about, the you know, automation, the demographics and the geopolitics and the like, 
things aren't working. The cost structures are changing. Many companies need to move what they are producing today, or they need to think about changing the sort of footprint that they have in terms of production. So there's a huge moment right now that there really hasn't been for 30 years to, to move things around. And you know, just to give you a, a little you know, piece of information or sort of a statistic that brings it home to me is usually around the world, you see maybe 1% of supply chains, maybe up to 2%, but usually 1% of supply chains that move kind of where they are in terms of, of you know, different um, companies. A study just came out, a U.S. Chamber of Commerce in China um, study came out, and one third of those that were surveyed said they were, they were moving their supply chains. And another you know, majority said they were thinking about moving their supply chains. But one third said they were moving their supply chains. Decision made, they were moving. Um, now, they may not move everything, or they may just be excess capa you know, new capacity and the like, but the fact that there's so much movement happening right now means that we don't have to wait 40 years to create this. There is a time over this next five to 10 years where you're gonna see this reshuffling around the world. And North America could be a big part of that if they figure out some of these, you know, these bumps that you were talking about. Um, and so I don't think you need, I don't think you need 40 years, right? I think you could do it in a decade. Are there any other questions from the audience? Um, would you, if you'd like to raise your hand, the students yeah. will bring questions. I would like to add a little bit to what you're talking about, the regionalization of the North American continent and the Western Hemisphere, and it's World War II. Mm -hmm. During World War II, uh, the military down here in South Texas, 15% of the military war was from across the river. They came across in hordes. At the same time, they came across to work in the northern fields. Now, we talk about the Bracero program and the Paisanos, whatever you want to talk about, but all those people did not go to the fields of northern United States. They went north, they may have got, ended up in the field, but within 30 days to 90 days, they were in the factories, in the plants, in Ohio, in Akron, Ohio, different places, Chicago, West Chicago, Flint, Michigan, so on and so forth. They were working in the factories, helping build, because all of our men were fighting, 450,000 of our men were fighting. They left the women to do the industrial work, and they did it but they couldn't do everything. So here's the Mexican population given the green light to come north and work, and they did by the thousands all the way across. And they worked, they learned, they practiced, they become educated in the ways of business and so on and so forth. And they came back to Mexico. They took these trades, these skills, and these arts that they had, and they learned up there. Many of them stayed. This is why there's so many Hispanic names in Chicago, in, in uh, central United States, because they went up there to work and they learned and they came back. This is why the Pisanos come back. Every year they come back, they bring things with them. They bring knowledge with them. This comes back to the people of Mexico. They flourished from this. Mexico changed because it's, we, the United States fought the war basically by itself on this Pacific and the Atlantic. They had to have the arms and munitions and so on and so forth. These was built and manufactured a lot by the, the people, our friends from south of the border. They did this and they stayed up there. Their families stayed up there. You look at the Pisanos that come back by the thousands. You stop them and you ask them how they get there. Their father went up there to work. So they come back. So. The United States has never given the proper recognition of what Mexico did for the United States in World War II. It's been projected that 40% of the manpower, 60% of the goods were from across the border. We couldn't get them by sea because the Germans were sinking the ships. So we had two friends working together, President Camacho, President Roosevelt. They, they knew each other, they were friends, and they got along. They had suggestions and they let it go. People did it. They wanted to do it. They stayed. They made this country better. And had it not been for Mexico, we might be different. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I think that you know points out a lot of you know potential lessons for for today, right? One of those is that we have in the past seen seen movement of people back and forth, and and that's important, and and you know movement of goods and services as well. So there's there's a history where we can build upon. Um, and I think it also points to, you know, we do need leadership. Um, back to the, you know, the political question, we need leadership that 
um, is willing to talk with the people on the other side and, and really think more openly and, and think about working between the countries rather than, than dividing them off. I was waiting for others to ask you know, questions first. First of all, thank you so much for sharing your insight in relation to the importance of regional collaboration. Uh, from the US federal level perspective uh, in relation to ESG, uh, what do you think the US needs to focus on in order to bring forth effective collaboration between North American and Latin American firms, especially Mexico? Uh, to transform to technology-intensive uh, industry going forward for the next 100 years? Mm -hmm. Sure, well, I would say, I mean, one of the good things about the USMCA agreement is there's a lot of ESG in there, right? You have uh, much stronger environmental provisions, you have much stronger labor provisions there. And we have seen the US government, the USTR, use those and, and, and you know, companies and the like use those um, to enforce you know, labor rules and, and regulations, and, and particularly in Mexico and places where there were allegations of, of abuses um, on the labor front. So I think there is some of the agreements that we have where you have baked in ways to, to improve some of, of that those aspects. I mean, one of the interesting things as we go forward is we have lots of companies, um, and particularly publicly listed companies, who have made pledges, right? They have made pledges about, you know, going carbon neutral by a certain amount of time or other kinds of, of pledges that they have made. And so as they think about their global footprint, um, they will also be thinking with an eye to meeting those pledges. So for instance, if you're, you know, a manufacturing company or you have a company that has a, a product um, you're going to make sure that that product or the suppliers that lead into that product, you know, the pieces and parts that come into that product um, are made in places uh, that have, you know, clean energy matrices so that you're not, you know, increasing sort of the carbon footprint so that, you know, if you're tracing your your carbon footprint, you know, your, you know, emit your one, two and three emissions and the like, um, you can say that this is, you know, that you're meeting your, your goals and the like. So I think that is um, a, you know, a challenge, but also a way that you're starting to see, particularly working in Latin America. And, you know, Mexico right now has, has you know, is moving, I would say, backward on, on that sort of that carbon promise or sort of the, the clean energy promise um, as they revert back to more fossil fuels and a focus on that. But it is an opportunity, frankly, for all, lots of countries in the Western Hemisphere, because you have a region in Latin America that actually right now has a very clean electricity grid. Half of the electricity that's produced in, in Latin America is, is from renewable sources. And there's and you know lots of you know potential solar, potential wind, potential geothermal. So there's a lot of potential in these countries. There's also, if you look at the Western Hemisphere, there is a huge potential in the green technologies of the future, right? Green technologies, at least as they're structured so far, need lots of lithium, they need copper, they need cobalt, they need nickel, they, you know, there's a whole set of critical minerals that they need for electric vehicle batteries, for other kinds of, um, you know, other kinds of equipment that go into renewables. And this is a hemisphere that has a whole lot of those. Um, and so I think there's an opportunity um, for, countries in the region and the United States being part of, of that um, and thinking about the Western Hemisphere to really push forward on this green agenda and, and benefit in that sense because they are there's a source of, of both renewable energies themselves as well as the components that go into the equipment that will allow renewable energies um, or, or you know cleaner energy matrices. Um, and, and there's a you know I think a possibility there. So so there are possibilities here, but um, it's going to take a lot of money. You know, financing is always a challenge, um, as we've already heard. Um, it's going to take a lot of money. So whether that's from private sector, whether that's spurred by U.S. government or multilaterals and the like, um, I think there's you know a lot to unlock this. But I think there's a lot of potential here for you know the kinds of things you're talking about. Good evening. I'd like to thank you also for the presentations. Excellent uh, uh, presentation on the book. I want to go to the European region and, uh, you know, why regions matter and something that maybe the United Kingdom didn't, maybe they need to read your book. So I'm, I'm thinking... It's too late. <laughs> yeah, it is a little too late or they're having second thoughts to some degree. But I wanted to focus on that and the deregionalization uh, in that area. Have you looked at and have you seen what some of the repercussions are on the fact that you have here... 
a country that has, does a lot of right things, but just messed up on this decision? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. The Brexit decision, I think, in in some ways, is the you know the exception that proves the rule, right? And you look at the you know the economic outcome, the commercial outcome of of Britain over these last couple of years, and in the in the you know detachment from from European Union, um, they are the you know one country uh, among the European countries that has yet is just barely recovering to their COVID you know um, GDP levels. So they've been much slower to increase. Um, their outlook is much gloomier than the European countries, um, even with Russia and, and you know the challenges of gas and, and many of the others. They you know their growth potential seems much less. And when you look at at you know the UK's own figures from from their you know from their government, you know the cost to their overall economy and their economy in the future um, is is really significant in terms of you know sort of per capita person. It's thousands of dollars that they're going to lose in sort of overall. Um, growth within their economy. Um, and, you know, there's other just sort of more concrete things. You know, they're suffering from um, worse labor shortages than, than anywhere else because lots of the people that would have come in the European Union now are, are leaving from the European Union. Um, and, and so I think, you know, uh, even for the, you know, diehard Brexiters um, who wanted it for social and cultural reasons and the like, um, they, they are seeing the huge economic costs. Um, on the flip side, what I do find interesting is you know, Europe has over and over faced crises and there's lots of challenges of the European Union. And, and, you know, through the years they have sort of, when they faced a crisis, they seem to double down on integration rather than pulling back. So, you know, in the 1970s, they, you know, faced a crisis in terms of their trade and inflation and the like. And so they doubled down on a, a common market and got rid of lots of regulations. And then they were facing a currency crisis and then they created a current, rather than divide up, they created one currency, the euro. And, and so they've kind of done that. But what's interesting is in the wake of Brexit, much of the the debate within the European nations changed. Um, so one, you see when polls were done of Europeans, the those who wanted to stay, you know, the average citizen of, of European nations who wanted to stay in the European Union shot up. So the vast majority are, no, we want to stay in the European Union. And even those, you know, politicians who had before called for leaving the European Union changed their tune. So people like Marie Le Pen in, in France and, and, you know, some of the, um, you know, the Italians sort of the, you know, who were sort of more on the right and talking about leaving, they changed the way they talk about it. No one talks about leaving anymore. They talk about changing and reforming from within. And we want this change, we want that change, but nobody's talking about leaving anymore. So it's interesting while, you know, Britain left um, and, you know, has suffered economic consequences and so far, it's still the UK. We'll see. There's some, you know, disgruntled Scots and others who, who are thinking about, you know, um, perhaps you know, we'll see if the UK remains the UK or if it just becomes, you know, England or what have you. Um, but what you've seen is the galvanizing and really the pulling together of Europe in, in, in kind of seeing the benefits that they have, right? And, 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 you know, we've even seen a couple countries who adopted the euro, so really doubled down on Europe in a way that they hadn't before. So I think it's, it's interesting. Um, I'm sorry for Great Britain, because it's an amazing country, but I think it has, um, you know, I think we may, in another generation, may see them wanting to come back in. So let's take another question from online. Um, so this is from David Lamb, and he wants to know, could you please discuss some further specialized industries for these opportunities for, for regionalization, um, especially over the next uh, five to 10 years for our upcoming MBA graduates? <laughs> All right. Yes, exactly. The businesses you should start, right? So there are a whole host of, of industries here, but you know, I, let me start with the ones that the U.S. government has designated as national security concerns, right? So the U.S. government over the last couple of years um, has laid out, you know, sort of four areas that they think are vital to U.S. national security. There's, I'm sure, there will be more because it's an expanding, it's an expanding uh, set of, of issues, but. You know, one is semiconductors. Um, so we see semiconductors and the, and the need to have them in places that um, we feel are secure. So we have access to semiconductors, which drive our lives and also our military and the like. Um, and we've seen the US government putting tens of billions of dollars behind creating a semiconductor industry in the United States. And one of the things about semiconductors is, you know, lots of that money and lots of the activity in the United States is going to you know, fabs, so, you know, the actual manufacturing of semiconductors, but 
you know, in order to be secure, if this is a national security concern, it, you have to have the whole part. You have to have the critical minerals that go into it. You have to have the processing of those. You have to have the creation of the chips. You have to have the testing and packaging that ends up on the other side. And so I think there's an opportunity there for the United States, for many of those, but also for Mexico, for Canada, for others who are allies of the United States to take a part of that chain as you try to recreate it, um, one that right now is really almost solely in Asia. So that's one area. Um, critical minerals themselves, I talked about those, you know, there's a lot in places around the Western Hemisphere. And, and so mining and refining of those and processing, that's something I think that is a, a business opportunity. Um, another is we've seen a lot of U.S. money um, going into electric vehicle batteries and those supply chains. So if you can hook in and there's various parts to those as you think about electric vehicles and, and the parts that go in. I think there's huge opportunities there also for the United States, but also for those in the neighbors. Um, and then, you know, that I put on the table are you know, pharmaceuticals and medical devices. That's another one that's seen as a national security concern, right? We want to make sure if there's another pandemic or something else that we have access to medicines that, you know, most of those are made in China. And, um, you know, we all kind of remember at the beginning of the pandemic, you couldn't get a mask or, you, you know, there were times when, you know, aspirin and other things were, were not available. And so I think those kinds of how do we make sure that our health is, is insured and how does some of that come home? And there'll be money behind some of that. So I think those are places to start. Um, but I also see around the world, even without, you know, national security concerns and without, you know, tens of billions of dollars of, of subsidies and investments, you're starting to see movement in all kinds of stuff. So I think electronics is a place, you know, you have seen with the tariffs that were put on in 2018 that have lasted to today, um, you've seen an exodus of electronics companies from China. Um, and so just to give you a couple statistics, back in 2018, 43% of the electronics coming to the United States came from China. Today, it's 31%. So you have seen a huge percentage change. Now, most of that went to Southeast Asia, um, but it could come here. It could come to Mexico if we figured out some of these supply chains. And so it sort of shows that kind of thing is up for grabs. Um, so long story short, I think there are so many opportunities there. Um, and as you see this movement around, um, you know, find the sector that you're actually interested in, you want to learn a lot about and, and see where you can dive in and in, in just a part. And I think the other thing I would say is what's different about global, I mean, there's globalization has been part of our life for, you know, centuries, for, for eons, right? You know, the, the Silk Road that people talked about with Marco Polo, that was globalization of its day, right? And we've seen the ebbs and flows. But what's different about these last 40, 50 years is globalization was really about supply chains. So what was being sent across borders was not finished goods, but much more often pieces and parts and components. So 75% of trade today is what economists call intermediate goods, right? The things that go into that final product. And so as you think about business ideas and opportunities, it's not just making the car, it's not just making you know, the iPhone, or it's not just making you know, other kinds of products. What about the pieces and parts that go into it? What about the services along the way? I mean, I think that is where the opportunity is. And that is where if the United States with its neighbors is going to succeed in building supply chains, you need all of those complicated pieces to make it work well. Thank you. We have some more questions down here. Thank you. I uh, would like to thank uh, Tammy Yu and IBC and Commerce uh, Bank for having you speak today. Um, I used to attend quite a, quite a few of the keynote speaker series, but um, with my background being in transportation, rail in particular, I saw goods flow between Canada, the US, and Mexico for the last 30 to 40 years. Um, so of all the speakers that I've heard, and, and I haven't been in a while, you're definitely the valedictorian in my book of, of speakers because of what, what this presentation means to Laredo. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's about regions and about the world, but, but in particular, Laredo, I think, uh, has a lot to gain from a North American region. And for that reason, because I saw the flow of goods, uh, everything from, from lumber to paper to, you know, the components for assembly that you talk about, um, <clears throat> we have a symposium here that, that, that has been put on for a number of years. And back sometime, it was just known as the Logistics and Manufacturing uh, uh, you know, Symposium, but a couple of us got together and pushed to have it renamed into the uh, North, um, North America, the most competitive region in the world. 
uh, symposium, and that goes back probably 12, 15 years, because we saw that, you know, what you're talking about, um, that Canada, the U.S., and Mexico have got to work together, you know, if, if we're going to make it. And uh, this nation obviously has been blessed, like Kate Smith used to sing back in the 50s and early 60s. Some people might remember, God bless America. He definitely did. He definitely did. We have oil, we have gas, we have coal, we have trees, we have ores, we have everything that, that a country, you know, we have the technology, we have labor, but we've, we've kind of <clears throat> begun to regulate ourselves uh, to the point that that competitiveness that we hold is, is going out the window a little bit. And I say it because I saw uh, Saudi Arabia shift from oil to aluminum production and it was coming through the U.S. into Mexico. Uh, and if you, if you saw the uh, soccer tournament, the uh, a Dubai uh, mm. skyline, incredible, incredible. And all that was built probably with oil and gas money. So there's a lot to be said about the trillions of dollars that are underground. And I, and I agree with, with making sure that we take care of this planet. But rather than shifting completely from what we were blessed with to something totally different, we should try to find ways to burn coal cleaner, to burn oil cleaner, to burn gas cleaner. Uh, God knows we harvest trees, we plant 10 to 15 for everyone, but I think because there's so much difference in the way people look at things and what needs to be done, we're going to extremes in certain things, but, but um, you know, North America's got transportation, raw materials, natural resources, labor, technology, and at one time, the best quality in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, rather than a question, it was more just to say thank you so much for agreeing to come down and speak. Um, and, and again, thank you to, to IBC, uh, Commerce Bank, and Tammy Yu. Uh, you know, we, we, we definitely have um, a lot of work to do to uh, convince or to create an awareness um, with those politicians that you mentioned, uh, how important uh, sticking together, if you will, playing as a team, uh, Canada, North America, uh, and uh, Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. It's very, very important that we that we begin to to look at our 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 things that we have in common as opposed to our differences. So, thank you again. Thank you. Well said. <laughs> I would like to go back to this question of the mindset change that is required. Um, I see it as very, very, very difficult because as uh, we recall, the, one of the main factors in Brexit is, was racism. And if we look at North America, the big player is the US. Okay? And when we talk about national security and retrenchment to uh, regions, um, we are talking basically at the country level and the highlight of nationalism. And that goes against the sharing that you suggested, at least at the regional level. Not to speak of uh, sharing that doesn't happen even within countries, you know? Uh, we have a huge skew, uh, well distribution, we have uh, partisan fragmentation that is tremendous going on right now here. So how we expect uh, the sharing to happen at the regional level? So you know, none of this is easy, right? Um, and we all, we all know our politics, we all know that none of this is easy, but you know, as I look at lessons from around the world, I do see countries overcoming huge differences and polarization um, in this regional process. And I think particularly in Asia, I would point to, you know, this is a region where, you know, Asian regionalization is very different. European was about treaties and diplomats getting together and signing treaties and taking down tariffs and regulations and putting one passport and this sorts of thing. Asia's path was very different. Asia's path was CEOs going out and outsourcing and, and finding labor. They were followed by their governments who would build infrastructure, they'd build ports and the like. 
But it was really led in many ways by the private sector. And the first to do it were the Japanese. They started in the 1960s. They ran very quickly out of labor. And so they started putting factories in, at the time, very poor South Korea and Taiwan and then in other places. But you know, when they were doing that, Japan had been a colonizer of South Korea just 20 years before. So they, you know, they had just been there in military uniforms and now they're coming back in business suits. And and so the you know the tensions between these, the nationalism that was there, the sort of animosity that you saw, which you still see today between Japan and South Korea if you follow some of their politics and the like. They were still able to regionalize with, with that happening. And, you know, following up, you know, the biggest foreign direct investor in, in China for many years was Japan. This is another country where they were at war together and the nationalism and the xenophobia, may I say, between those two countries was, is very significant. So, look, is it easy? Of course, it's not easy to get over these differences. But, you know, as you look at the, robustness and deepness of Asian supply chains, they were able between these countries to overcome, you know, past wars, still ongoing conflicts and, and disputes over border disputes, um, you know, different identities about, you know, they have their own, you know, racism and xenophobia and patriotism, and they were able to find a way to create this sort of factory Asia around those things. So I guess what I would say is, uh, you know, I think every region faced, faced real challenges. Um, there's different paths to get there, but I don't see these things as necessarily being totally insurmountable um, because we have examples around the world where, where they have been surmounted. I, I saw some other questions down around here. Is anyone else? I apologize to people who I who I missed. Um, it's uh, it's always difficult trying to <laughs> see here from the state from the state. So uh, you talked about the regionalization uh, in terms of trade of goods, and my question is whether we will observe the same trends in capital movement, especially from the 70s and 80s after the deregulation. So my question is whether globalization is not much as trade of goods, but, all, but instead the capital movements? Yeah. No, that's a great question. And interestingly, finance is also quite regional. Um, in part, it is because European banks tend to work within Europe, and they're such a big part of, of sort of the movement of capital. But when you look at bank loans, when you look at mergers and acquisitions, when you look at these other kinds of financing, it does tend to be regional. Definitely in Europe, it's the sort of the most regional somewhat in Asia, especially when you look at bank loans, they do a little bit less of the M&A and the like, but you see that you see, and often what happened is, you know, Japanese banks would follow their companies and, and fund their companies to build the manufacturing, right? And then Singaporean banks would follow. And so you get a little bit of the ties because the money follows the actual economic activity, which became very regional. Interestingly, you know, you saw in the sort of 90s, 2000s, a bit of these sort of global aspirations and banks going global. Um, but even in those times, sort of the big global banks like JP Morgan, right? JP Morgan's a global bank. Yeah, it is, except that 80% of their uh, revenues and profits are made in North America. So yes, they have offices and you know, you could pick the number of countries, but they're really in the end, a regional bank. And you see that with Deutsche Bank, you see that with a lot of these big players. And since the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, that regional aspect of finance has become even more so because lots of banks had had aspirations to sort of global footprints um, decided to scale back and just focus on on particular areas. So you've seen um, the regional aspect of finance has become interestingly sort of more significant over over the last 15 years. Um, let me say a word about services because that's the other one, right? I was talking about goods, but services is another part. Um, services are not all that traded. Um, they're not as traded as goods, and partly you know there's restrictions and and, and limits and licenses and the like. Um, they're beginning to be more traded. Um, they are somewhat less regional, but they still have a regional bent, which is interesting because you would think services, you know, cost nothing to move things around. You know, you just send a file and then it's onto the other side of the world. But you still have a regional aspect, and there's a few reasons why. One is some of the biggest parts of services are um, tourism, and people just tend to take vacations nearby. So, you know, 75% of the people who take European vacations are Europeans, <laughs> you know? Asia, it's even more, when Asians go to go abroad, they tend to stay in Asia. So part of it's that. 
Um, education too is an international service and there too when students go abroad, sure some of them go to the other side of the world, but many fewer. They tend to stay in countries next door or nearby. Um, so those services are, are closer tied. Um, another set is, you know, services like, you know, lawyers and accountants and consultants and the like. Um, sometimes, you know, the rules and things are, are within certain groups. So, you know, your services as an accountant don't apply in a, the other side of the world because they have different systems and the like. So that's part of it. Um, or you see, you know, again, Europe, you're allowed, those people are allowed to move around in ways that you're not allowed to move around, um, you know, between other countries. If you don't have free trade agreements, you don't have agreements on services. Um, and then finally, you know, the geopolitics is also hitting services, right? If you go to China, you can't use Facebook, you can't use Google because it's not allowed and vice versa. You know, the apps that you use, Badu and other things you use in China, you don't, you don't use here. TikTok being the exception. Um, but other than that, do so you see some, you know, fragmentation, if not regionalization in, in lots of services in the way. And I think as we harden on this, you know, sort of geopolitical line and, and divides between the U.S. and China, which is coming not just from the U.S., but also from China, right? They want to pull back as well. I think you're going to start seeing limits on transfers of data and the sorts of things that will make services much harder to, to be truly global and span, and span the globe as well. I think we have time for maybe one or maybe two if, um, questions. So if there's anything from the audience, um, anyone else who'd like to ask a final question? Um, so I, I guess I'll take the opportunity to, uh, to ask a question then. Um, so my, my question for you would be, you know, one thing when you look at North America is, does it, do you believe it really has the potential for regionalization in the ways that other regions do? I mean, if you're Canada, you don't have any countries nearby you except for the United States. Even if you're the United States, you know, Mexico and, and the US, uh, Mexico and Canada are close, and then you've got small Caribbean islands and some Central American countries. No. But it doesn't seem like you have the big population centers that you would have in, you know, if you're, if you're Korea or if you're China or if you're Vietnam, you're, you're surrounded by um, densely populated um, urban areas. Yeah. Um, so that, that's what I'm, so when yeah. you talk about the US being less regionalized, how much of a role do you think that plays in it? So if you bring North America together, it has about 480 million people, almost 500 million people. That's about the size of the European Union. So it's a sort of a similar comparative size. It obviously is not the size of Asia, given that you know China is 1.3 billion and India has surpassed it recently. I mean, India's in South Asia, but, but you could imagine a broader Asia definition. So there is a population size that matters, um, but as we get into more automation, as you know, it's more about productivity per worker. It's not just about, can I have so many workers? It's like, how productive, how productive can they be? How much can I do with the population I have? I think there is, um, I think it does matter. And as if you look at, well, two things. One is if you look at the market size, the U.S. is still the biggest market in the world. So it still has that benefit. And you know, Mexico and Canada are no small shakes either, right? So you sort of expand it that way. The other thing that North America provides um, that for the United States, and this is sort of a self-serving since we're sitting here in the United States, is that the United States has actually very few free trade agreements around the world. We have preferred access to less than 10% of the globe's GDP. Mexico and Canada, alternatively, they have a lot of free trade agreements and they have preferred access, so tariff-free access, to 60% of the globe's GDP. So if we make a car here, assemble a car here in the United States, um, and we want to send it to Europe, it will pay a 10% tariff. If that car is assembled in Mexico and it's sent to Europe, it will pay no tariff. So if 10% tariff, it's not going to be affordable. Nobody's going to buy it. 0% tariff, people potentially will buy it. So as we think about how to, what regionalization brings to the United States economy, it brings us access, tariff-free access potentially, at least for some of our parts and suppliers, it brings us tariff-free access to 50% of the globe's GDP that we don't currently have. Um, and that is a huge market, right? That's 3.5 billion people that we could potentially sell at a competitive, have a competitive chance at selling our products to or providing our products. So I think as we think about it, it's not just, oh, if we have, you know, is 500 million people enough? It's like, what does, what does this creating this platform mean in terms of our ability to reach the globe's consumer? And I would say what it does provide is a lot. So if there's no more questions from the audience, um, I would like to um, thank uh, Dr. O'Neill for uh, an, excellent, an excellent talk. So thank you very much.
Thank you all so much. I want to um, thank Amy Palacios, who's the Associate Director of the Center for Study of Western Hemispheric Trade, and she manages this whole event and, and makes it all work. Um, I'd also like to thank um, the staff in the School of Business who are here helping us, and our, our friends from OIT who are, who are allowing us to broadcast it, and to event services. Um, and also I'd like to thank the students from the Dean's Student Advisory Council who have been carrying around microphones and guarding the doors here. So um, thank you all for coming, and um, thank you all, all of you, and I want to thank you all for coming, and I want to thank those of you online for listening online. And I should say, that I do, we do have a, a, um, a gift so that uh, Dr. O'Neill can remember coming here. And although our globe has gone from outside uh, um, in, in the entryway, we have a little globe to, to give to her.